great way for him to get the funds necessary to travel, even if he couldn't travel in royal splendor like the other gentleman travelers of the era. era. Uh, but first of all, let's look at the point where he loses his eyesight. He's in his mid-20s. And he has to find a way to rebuild his life. And I would imagine many people would despair because they think that they're going to have to be a shut in mostly since they'll be not welcomed into respectable society, as you described. So how does he begin the process of rebuilding his ability to navigate the city and the rest of the world? Well, this is also something that needed to be um extracted through allusions in the historical record, not illusions, but allusions, because from the very beginning, James Holman did not want to do what we would want him to do. And it's very frustrating, which is we'd love it if he would have written eloquently about what it meant to be blind, but actually in his writing, what he always wanted was for people to forget that he was blind. And we have to remember that he made a good, not of his living, a good means of underwriting these these travels by actually writing travel books. He wrote, I think, six six or seven volumes of travel writing. Uh, the earlier one of which, the first one, was at least a, uh, a bestseller. And uh, so he was writing travel books. These books were intended to be as as works of actual travelogue, of advice. They weren't about being blind. So what he would do is he would address the idea that he was blind in the very first few pages, but he would do it as almost like a joke. He would dismiss it, like being very tall or being redheaded or something like that. And uh, um, so he would say, yes, I'm blind, but that makes me... Uh, more of an authentic guide because I'm not going to fall back on the tropes of, you know, static sightseeing quite literally. He would joke about that kind of thing, but he quite literally wanted you to forget as quickly as possible that he was blind. So his writing does not include a lot of references to what it meant for him to be blind. If anything, it would be the opposite and he would gloss over those things. So I would quite often for me to really understand put myself in the shoes, I'd have to go to secondary sources. For example, that scene that I had mentioned earlier about how when he went volunteered by himself to go up into the mountains of the island off the coast of West Africa and negotiate with the chieftain, um, I described what it smelled like that day, what it felt like underfoot um, as he walked up through the different um, different climate zones. Um, I mentioned that it had rained recently and it got concentrated the scents. And then I described the scents of the, uh, of the trees that he's walking through, uh, described the, the song of the birds there, um, all this kind of stuff that I'm doing, I'm putting myself into his head. All of that information I had to compile from secondary sources. I had to go to the ship's log and find that it had rained the previous day. I went through a, a you know a biological survey of the place, which trees were there, which birds were there, that kind of stuff. I all had to put together because what he did was project this typical British, oh what ho, no problem. It was it was such fun. <laughs> so that's one thing things things that I had to do. He did not see himself as a spokesperson for the blind and is never interested in giving us giving us that except as point of amusement. Hmm. So to answer your question, Scott, I guess what that really means is that that what I do know is that when he went blind, he then went through a long period, uh, I think the better part of a year, where he just simply sat quietly in a room. <laughs> and in that case, it does seem that he spent a lot of time kind of remaking his understanding of the world. Uh, but he somehow emerged from that period with a, uh, a very specific plan to, uh, to a, um, first of all, legitimize himself. Because like I said, the stigma of being a young blind person at the time. So he did go, he did apply to become a naval knight of Windsor 
which was kind of a complicated thing. And then no sooner did he get to that point than he began, I would say, basically gaming the system to, uh, to end up going where he wanted to go. Yeah, I love the cleverness there. I would assume it's authentic on his part to petition to be able to travel for his health and go sample the waters in a warmer climate. But essentially, he takes what is a lifelong subsidy for those veterans who are come under a medical condition like himself and then use it to travel the world. So I love the use of finances there, free travel. Very smart on his part. Yes, that's uh, that was it was quite amusing for me to, to, to figure that out as well. And once again, this is a case where he didn't point out to to the reader what he was doing. I had to look at him go, like getting away with something here, isn't he? And that's basically uh, um, he that that is what the naval knights of Windsor were. The naval knights of Windsor, uh, even though they were called knights, were actually a, a, a glorified or a dignified charity, and the there was one of the few charities for disabled people. Uh, and for, uh, for, you know, war veterans, that sort of thing. And there were all of seven people, uh, who were all naval gentlemen who were disabled in one way or another, who were given the right to live in Windsor Castle, uh, in company with King George III at the time. And, uh, so it seemed like a very nice, um, you know, dignity, but the reality that they had a job to do there and their job was to climb up the hill to the uh, St. George's chapel and uh, pray for the health of the Royal family uh, several times a day. And it was actually quite onerous to do that. And it turned out that um, James Holman gave a go of it for a little while and then understood that he was not actually going to spend the rest of his life offering up prayers to King George III, who at that time was uh, sequestered in another wing of the castle, quietly going insane. And uh, so he came up with his first scheme, which was uh, not to be traveling, but to go to medical school. And it was astonishing to me to find that, uh, you know, as, as soon as he had gotten what is essentially this pity appointment for to be a handicapped person, he then becomes, as far as I can tell, the very first blind person to attend medical school and not just any medical school. He goes to the university of Edinburgh, which then as now is uh, one of the foremost centers for medical education in Europe. And this is well before the invention of Braille. So he's absorbing oral lectures and somehow synthesizing the information well enough that he can pass exams. If I remember from your book correctly. Yes. And that was another, another surprise, another sort of unlearning that I had to do because when I set out to, to write the book, I thought, well, there has to be a treasure trove of information about James Holman at, at the University of Edinburgh because, you know, the first blind person to attend medical school would certainly have attracted a whole lot of media attention and there'd be a whole lot of correspondence about whether or not he should have been admitted. I mean, how did he even pull off a feat like that in the first place? And it took me a lot of time to understand that the entire process was very different uh, than as it is now. That instead of putting up the high bar of examinations to go to medical school, the professors at the time made their money almost entirely from the tickets that they sold for their lectures. So if you wanted to go to medical school, you didn't actually have to pass an examination board. You simply showed up and you started paying for the lecture tickets. And you do that and it's perfectly okay if you're sitting in the back of the, of the lecture hall, nobody is paying attention to whether or not you are, are looking or even sighted. And so it's very interesting because he does seem to have gone through this entire process without calling that much attention to himself. And uh, he actually, he did not, get sit for a medical degree, but he actually, I found, first of all, that, uh, that the majority of people who go to medical school did not bother to get the degree before they left school and set up shop because <laughs> it was an extra, it was an extra fee. It was like paying your parking tickets or something like that. And it was an extra fee and it literally meant nothing because there was no certification whatsoever. So there were actually a lot of people who 
became medical doctors who had less medical education than he did. Uh, but he never claimed to be a medical doctor. However, he did travel with medicine with a medical kit, and he did, in fact, treat other people uh, uh, from time to time. So we did have quite an advanced amount of knowledge about that. But what's fascinating is that I did manage to look at the classes that he had taken, and it's kind of heartbreaking because almost all of them were very specifically not medicine in the abstract, but medicine that could have been affected to him. So... I, once again, he never said it flat out loud, but if you look at the courses that he was taking, including a couple that he took a few times, it does seem like he was maybe trying to get enough medical information to find out if there was a cure for his own blindness. So that's another point where he's kind of, he's kind of endearing himself to me. I feel really, really sad for him. But that seems to, to taper out at a certain point. And that's when, as you point out, he decides to go to Europe and take the waters, as was a typical cure of the time. And that was the, that was the biggest transition. Uh, he was prepared to go to, uh, to Europe and do a little bit of you know, what they called the grand tour in those days with his brother. His brother was going to be, uh, who was also a military person, was, all, was going to accompany him on the trip. But something happened for the last minute and he could not show up. So um, just apparently on impulse, James Holman got on the, uh, the ferry to France all by himself and then stepped off. And there he was in Europe, in France, and he could not. Uh, there's no indication that he could speak French at all and uh, did not really quite know how he was going to get the next 600 miles. And it took him several months, but it seemed to be such a transformational experience for him that in many ways, as best he could, he just kept going for the rest of his life. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Uh, one other thing before I get into the mechanics of this trip, because I think this is really where he develops his abilities as a traveler that he takes for the rest of his life. Uh, in your book, as you mentioned, uh, Holman doesn't directly talk about how he got around as a blind man, but you do your best to reconstruct what could have happened based on the experiences of other blind people. Or you mentioned he has a walking stick, but he's not using it as a cane the way uh, many blind do today, but as the accoutrement of a gentleman, as a gentleman's walking stick, but he's pounding the pavement and using the sounds and possibly echolocation. So could you describe what you think he was doing to be able to successfully navigate? Yeah, it's important to point out that not only is this before things like Braille were invented, uh, it's also before guide dogs were invented. And it's also uh, well before the typical blind man's uh, the cane that, that we think about, which is the, the forward-thrusting white cane, which is basically like a giant feeler that's being that's being thrusted forward. Um, Holman didn't didn't have that that ability, didn't have that technique. What he did have was a, your standard gentleman's uh, uh, cane with a uh, like a mouth like brick on the top, and at the bottom was a silver tip. And uh, <laughs> um, and it was very clear. There's some pictures of him with his cane. It was very clear that this was a very rigid cane, so you wouldn't use it to be poking forward and thrusting uh, like you would with the modern dick cane. But what you would do is you would hit it down the ground and you would hear the clicks. He does not call this ability echolocation. He does not have the the the, the terminology for it, um, but he does say that you know there's the space. He does describe this ability that he has going forward, um, and it was actually something that some people at the time uh, called facial vision. And facial vision was that they could feel with some perception of where they were in a space. And later experiments find out that that is echolocation. It was entirely sound based. So he had this, this walking stick that, you know, it was the one consistent thing that he carried with him. And the clicking sound that you could make with that by hitting it on the ground, um, interestingly enough, uh, had been duplicated by modern day blind accessibility experts uh, quite uh, and 
effect of, or people who have 